Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. Today, we have all of our co-hosts. Ramsey, how are you? Excellent. Great to be here. Will, good to see you. Really good to be here. Mark? Doing very well. Thanks, Paul. Good to be Uh, here. It's good to be here, and I'm looking outside and seeing snow, and I'm very glad that my commute is (laughs) down to... Down one floor, um, but today, listen, we we're, we're going to talk about a very interesting uh, topic, um, and it's going to be exploring one that we've explored uh, in a number of different ways. But we're, we're going to take sort of a novel tact, um, which is what what exactly is the impact of COVID on people either nearing retirement or quasi-retirement who've been impacted one way or another by uh, just unemployment, uh, job transitions. And with us today to talk more is um, a very uh, interesting academic researcher, uh, Siavesh Rodpour. Uh, Siavesh is the Associate Director of the Retirement Equity Lab at the New School in New York and has just done some really fascinating work looking at uh, re- retirement behavior and most recently the impacts of the pandemic. So Sivesh, well, welcome. Do you want us to, first of all, tell us more about who you are and, and tell us about the, uh, the new school and your, your role there. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Paul, for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here on your show. Uh, we at the uh, new school at the Retirement Equity Lab have been working on uh, the retirement system in the US, like different aspects of it, from social security to 401ks and IRAs and personal savings, and see how the system is affecting people, how the system is matching individual behavior, and in the end, uh, how it affects the well-being of uh, retirees in the US. So I'm glad to be here and talk about the impact of COVID on them today, specifically, and uh, how people are doing in general. Excellent. And um, I'll just uh, s- s- sort of lead off and tell us um, it, 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 tell us sort of the, the, your view of the connection between you know, the pandemic and um, people who may be nearing retirement. Well, the, the pandemic and recession is obviously affecting everyone. There is nobody who is not affected. The kids have to stay home and don't go to the school and can't see their friends. And many have lost their jobs, which is a more severe consequence. But our studies show that older workers have been affected more severely when compared to like mid-career workers. Like uh, young people fresh out of college, they have been also hit very hard because nobody's hiring uh, and uh, the unemployment for young people was uh, very high at the beginning of the pandemic at least. Uh, but when you look at people with established careers and uh, jobs who typically have very low unemployment rates, which are like uh, 35 to uh, 45 year old and older workers, you see that those who are over 55 have been hard, much harder in this recession for the first time. And it's especially because of COVID. So you see many of them uh, lose their jobs and some of them have to leave the labor force because they think it's too risky to be out there looking for jobs, or they just give up because they see that no one is hiring older workers right now. And that's the main impact. Like, of course, uh, there was all the fluctuations in the stock market in the beginning that like affected the 401ks, but hopefully that's gone. Now, now uh, most 401ks are doing well if uh, people were smart and didn't withdraw from their accounts uh, when it hit the rock bottom. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, but I believe the main impact is the unemployment and either uh, people having to take money out of their uh, retirement savings or just losing the time they had to save more for retirement and preparing. And we will see the effect of it unfortunately soon. And how do you how do you go about quantifying this? Uh, do you, are you thinking about and is there going to be a lost generation of 
future retirees? Uh, is it, are you think, do, do you quantify based generationally? Are you basing it, quantifying it longitudinally, like how long it will take me to retire or the quality of retirement? How, how do you start to think about the magnitude? Yeah, like it's very difficult to say because all these things uh, are related to each other. Like if you don't have money, it's hard to live long because the stress will kill you. <laughs> so it's very difficult to say like uh, that, oh, uh, people have a decided like uh, life expectancy, decided life quality and how like it's going to be affected by uh, more or less savings. And it's also very uh, hard to quantify like each single factor because how things are correlated uh, and affect each other. Uh, so we usually look at like generation to generation differences and this generation of older workers and near retirees are <clears throat> have had a very rough time uh, since the previous recession because many of them bought their houses when like at the peak of the housing bubble so they spend a lot for their houses and they're still paying back their mortgages which was something that previous generations didn't do they were done with their mortgages at 50. But now you see, like, when you look at the death level at, for uh, new, retire new retirees, you see, like, high levels of mortgage debt, which also eats into their retirement savings again. Uh, so many of them will be paying mortgage in retirement, which is a new thing, didn't exist before. Same with the student debt. Either they have a student debt of their, for their own or for their children, because they're paying for their children and for their grandkids. So this is a new thing again for this specific generation. They were hit by the recession. So because of recession, they didn't see the wage growth uh, they would have seen before. Their assets were hit by the recession, uh, by financial crisis. So they're having a quite rough time. And then on top of that, you have changes in social security that will cut their benefits. And now there is this pandemic and you add all these factors and many people say that, oh, the only way out for these people is to work longer. And that's why we care so much about them being able to work longer because most people are not. And the COVID is showing that to us. The, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is showing that they don't have control over how long they can work or whether or not they can work because now uh, the employers don't want them because they're risky. And they see that, okay, if I hire an older worker and they get sick, then the consequences for them will be severe and I will be responsible for that. So the Republican uh, solution to that, which would work maybe, was that to say that, okay, employer doesn't have any liabilities. And uh, to just let the employers hire more older workers without being worried about the, uh, the consequences. But on the other side, what happens to the risk? what happens to the risk of sickness and death. So it's a very hard time for older workers. Hey, Savesh, we talked uh, just a couple episodes ago about <clears throat> this whole notion of people working longer because they're, because for whatever reason, they don't have enough money in retirement. And that was going to be a, it was actually a prediction, I believe, for uh, uh, this year that we would see older people working longer. So what's, what, what do you foresee happening if, um, your, your research is showing that that's not really a possibility. But people are working longer. So people try to work longer. The question is, is it going to help them or not? Uh, so when like we use the basic like spreadsheet models, uh, like on Excel, we can make a, a small model and see how much people we are able to save if they work one more year. Uh, and how that will affect their well-being in retirement. And you see that if people like retire at older ages, like if you work until 70, then you will be fine. You will get a lot of money from social security. You will have, a lot, you will have lots of savings and you will be all right. The truth is most people won't be healthy enough to work until 70. The more painful fact is that the pays are so low at older ages, like because the peak earning is happening at 45 to 50. And after that, some people experience wage growth, but many will experience uh, declining wages. So
So you will reach at some level and see that, okay, it's not even worth working any longer because I will make less than if I just claim social security. And that's true for a large portion of people. Like a quarter of people would make less if they kept working longer and uh, without claiming social security. So for these people, it's actually the rational decision to just claim social security early, like when they are 64 or 65. And we all know it's a bad decision. It will cut their benefits significantly. But the truth is, if they work, they will be poor. They will not make enough money to live. So, so I, I just had a quick question about social security in, in two parts. So um, the first one, you know, sort of refers back to a, a slide I saw from this presentation you made a, a couple of years ago, and it was striking to me. You showed how important social security is for the vast majority of the population. And the conclusion was very interesting. And I'll let you, I'll let you talk about it because it was, uh, was striking to me. Yeah, so social security was uh, designed to prevent poverty in the US. So prevent poverty at older ages completely. And it was quite successful at the beginning. But then eventually, the amount of benefits was cut. So right now it covers like an average, something around like 35% of pre-retirement income, uh, which is not that much. It's not enough for many people and leaves some people in poverty, like if they were making uh, not that much money before uh, retirement. But it was also supposed to be one part of the uh, retirement system. So on top of social security, you were, you were supposed to have your pension plan or whatever retirement plan your uh, work is offering. And on top of that, you were supposed to have your personal savings and assets. But now we see that most people don't have any retirement plans at work. So all the pensions and 401ks like cover uh, realistically about half of the uh, workers. And optimistic uh, assessments of the system, like when uh, they think like what would happen if we had auto enrollment and we were like forcing everyone to participate in the, panel, in, the, in, the in the plans, it goes maybe up to two thirds at best. But even those mean that like a third of our workers have no plan at work at all. So nothing to participate in. And then you, you add that the uh, high levels of debt and the wage stagnation, and you will see that there is no personal savings either. Like the, people have their retirement assets and their housing. There is no like financial asset. There is no liquidity going on. So then we see that most people, all they have is social security in retirement. They have their house and they have their social security. So, so that was, yeah, that was the critical thing is you showed this chart. You said, okay, we know what matters for the bottom 20%. You said, oh, by the way, it matters for the bit middle 20% as well. And you said the only people that may or may not need it are the top 20%. So that means 80% for 80% of yeah. the population, it's, it's mission critical. And uh, uh, I would say even for top 20%, social security is very important. Yeah. Uh, especially because uh, it works as an annuity and not everyone is smart enough to buy one. So social security is very important for them because of the uh, longevity risk they're facing yep. and covers for them. So even for rich people, social security is very valuable uh, and maybe they can survive without it, but it doesn't mean that social security is not important for them. So, so I guess going back to kind of what you are talking about before about the impact of individuals in their later years of employment. Now let's take 55 to 63. So individuals that are not yet old enough to take social security. Mm -hmm. um, I know when we were talking earlier, you said we've not yet seen a huge spike in, in early withdrawals from retirement plans. Like, do you see that coming And Like to what level do you think that'll happen from those individuals? I mean, that's a big part of the workforce that's in that age group. Yeah. Uh Unfortunately, we have very uh, little data on that, on uh, withdrawal from retirement plans, because these are individual accounts. There is no like central system to uh, allow us to see if people are actually withdrawing or not. 
And again, they are uh, legally allowed to pay back whatever they are withdrawing right now in three years so that they won't face yeah. the penalty and they won't pay income taxes on that. So there is this chance for them to make up for it. And the, uh, the only thing that uh, I am a bit optimistic about is that when I look at the number of people who are claiming social security, I don't see a huge jump in that. So maybe like if there is an increase of uh, two or 3%, but I'm not even sure about that. Uh, it can be just noise. And uh, that's for me a good sign. For me, uh, it means that people are waiting. People are hopeful that things will get better and will come back to work, or at least they will try. The danger is that if we let the recession stay, so if we don't deal with recession and we will have like longer terms of unemployment, especially for older workers, then we will see them uh, going to real retirement and giving up completely. So that's the real danger. Well, you know, on our, on, we, we had a, a five-part series, Reimagining Retirement. This was in partnership with our incubator. And uh, we had one guest on who's um, uh, uh, worked for a large service company in partnership with another large 401k provider. And he told us that their, their call centers were flooded with inquiries for people wanting to make early withdrawals from, from their 401k plan. And, but he said the actual numbers, he, 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 looked at, you know, glass half empty, glass half full. He said, well, half full is they haven't taken, they haven't actually acted on it. Um, but I, I believe like you do that if this goes on, that interest will turn into action. Um, what steps on the policy front should the new, new administration be taking? Well, we have a long list actually. We, we put together a long list uh, for the new administration to take a look at. Uh, of course, it's very important to make sure those who are um, unemployed out of labor force have access to financial resources so they don't have to claim social security, they don't have to tap into their retirement savings. Because, again, we all know retirement savings are supposed to be for retirement. Making it a source to deal with uh, all sorts of disasters and as an emergency saving is a mistake. Right now, people don't have emergency savings, so they don't have another choice. But if you're thinking of a retirement system, like no one is complaining why they can't borrow money from their pension plans, because they know pension plans are for retirement. They don't expect pension plans to come and help them when they're sick. They don't expect pension plan to, plans to come and help them when uh, their house is flooded. But we don't see 401 case that way, and that's a big mistake because 401ks are supposed to be our retirement system. And I think the government is also looking at it as a way out for itself. So instead of having a effective policy to counter disasters and counter recessions, they're saying, oh, your 401k is dead. But that's a mistake. Your, their 401k is not there. Their 401k will be there when they're retired. So that's part of the problem. And both Congress and the administration, Biden administration should deal with that. Uh, they made it permanent. They made the uh, uh, penalty exemption for early withdrawals permanent for any disasters. And that's a disaster on its own. Because it means, first of all, they're putting uh, people's retirement at risk. And secondly, because they are not going to do anything meaningful, thinking that, oh, they have their retirement savings. They are putting everyone with no retirement savings at risk. So it will hurt everyone in the end. So that's one well, sounds, part of it. Oh, sounds sorry. like it's compounding itself because we all talk about on this show quite often that people, you know, enough retirement assets is a big is a big hurdle for everyone. So um, what we're seeing now due to the pandemic, if people are accessing those funds early or penalty free or for whatever reason, for emergency reasons, mm -hmm. um, it's going to impact their ability to have mo enough money. Uh, that's already a challenge. So it's kind of like, instead of making a real decision, instead of uh, proposing real help for people, what the government is doing is making it easy for people to choose between being miserable now or in their retirement, which is not a real choice to give to people. Like maybe some people don't see that uh, right away, or maybe some people are hopeful saying that, okay, I prevent disaster right now. I deal with the, my problem right now. I will deal with uh, tomorrow's problem tomorrow 
but the truth is the government is not helping. <laughs> it's just letting people shuffle resources. Good, good intentions, potentially yes. poor outcomes. Yes. Uh, as yes. we encourage people to make wrong choices over the long haul. So I think that's very important. And that's the first thing they should do. The second thing is to make sure all their workers can go back to work as soon as possible. Vaccination is very important. They failed, they failed miserably to provide sa uh, safety standards to make sure that people are safe at work. But now, hopefully it will be over soon, or at least they don't say it, even, the, even Biden doesn't say it, but if older workers can get vaccinated sooner and go back to work safely, at least they won't have to rely on their retirement assets and they can go back to saving for their retirement and preparing for their retirement. I think that's very important. And it won't happen if they are not vac vaccinated and it won't happen if uh, the government doesn't deal with unemployment, uh, with high unemployment that's caused by the pandemic. So I think they are planning to deal with that, but I... These I don't are all items on your list? Are these yes. all the items on the list? And and where yes. did you is this a list that you that you that you published or that you've delivered to the new administration? Tell us how oh, we have tell us how you're sharing that, you yes. know, that to-do list with the world. Yeah, no, we have published it in some our website for uh, it's uh, we have the website Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the new school. Okay. Uh, and if you go there, you will see all of our research, including this note, which is a policy agenda for the Biden administration, protecting older workers and strengthening retirement security. So we have a list of like policy recommendations there, which by the way, include like establishing a uh, federal bureau under the uh, uh, Dep Department of Labor specifically for older workers because working longer is has become such an important uh, element uh, for uh, retirement security or maybe we should say lack of retirement security that makes people uh, work longer so we need to be aware of the conditions all the workers uh, are facing in the labor market and that needs more uh, concrete research a policy agenda for the biden administration okay we will yes. share this <laughs> thank you we will share this um so um what, what, maybe you could share with us what is the you know what is the number one uh, list or the number one item that you would propose that the, you know Biden would act on first? Oh, the first thing is uh, like the Bureau of Older Workers. We need concrete research on what's happening to older workers in the labor force and what's happening to their retirement savings. Like as we said right now there are people who know like anecdotally based on what whatever they are doing they know what's happening to the uh, 401k withdrawals but is the government gathering data on that no they don't care not that they don't care there is nobody who is supposed to care about that so uh, do people know like specifically about uh, type of works older workers are doing like do we know how many people have to become uh, Walmart greeters because they can't find a job? Like these are questions that we don't know the answer to because like there are some groups of researchers like me who are working on these issues, but there is no uh, center in the government who is looking at that. And older workers, workers over age 55 are like a quarter of our labor force. A quarter, right. one out of four people who are working are over age 55. And we need, uh, we need better research. We, we need better data on them. And I think that, that that's at the top of our agenda. Of course, dealing with COVID is very important, but we have long-term structural issues that we also have to deal with. And you know better, like even without COVID, it's not like people were ready to retire. The retirement assets were low even before COVID. COVID makes everything worse, of course, but it's not like we were fine with, uh, before that. And we shouldn't forget it. Yeah, well, and I, I look at your item number two, and I think to our industry, uh, I, Will, Mark, I'm, and Ramsey, I'm not sure how many annuity brochures have had pictures of sailboats on them when really you should be buying one of these annuities 
really to fund your healthcare because that's the number one cost. Mm -hmm. And I see, see recommendation two is really lower the, the age at which you could start taking Medicare. Yes, yes. And that will help, uh, of course, during uh, recessions and pandemic, right? We have right now with very high unemployment rate that forces people into choosing either between like the, their COBRA plan, which is super expensive. No one can afford it. No one can uh, spend that much money on healthcare or go after like uh, Medicare if they are eligible for, which is also not happening. So it's a very tough choice for many people, like during unemployment, how to stay insured. So that will be a tremendous help for them. And then it will make hiring older workers cheaper for employers. So they don't have to worry that, oh, if I hire like a bunch of older workers, my uh, healthcare premium will shut up. So that will help older workers in many different ways. It will keep them safe and it will make the employ it will make it easier for employers to hire them. So I guess in, in addition to like government intervention and policy changes and employer changes in terms of providing you know, more retirement support or, or, or hiring back individuals, what kind of conversations should, should clients be having with their agents and advisors right now to either mitigate the impact or prevent any future impact going forward for younger individuals? Well, it's it's difficult time for everyone. And again, people are shuffling resources. It's very important not to make things worse. Like it's very easy for us to say like, okay, when the stock market is down in, the, in a recession, you should not withdraw from your accounts. Just let it stay there. It will recover. But people are in need. If they need money, it's hard to tell them not to do that. That's why I that's why I usually focus on the policy side because that's something I can do without telling people like uh, what to do uh, given the situation they're facing necessarily. But it's always helpful whatever they want to do to make sure it it's not going to hurt them too much in future. So it's very important to understand the sacrifices they are making when they are taking money out of their uh, retirement plans, retirement accounts. Uh, and yeah, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes uh, it's hard to think about future when uh, you're facing problems right now. But if you do that, it's the story of the ant and grasshopper. If you don't think of future right now, it will hurt you. So that's the important things. And I think that's why it's always helpful to talk to a financial advisor or someone who has a, like a different point of view, different point of view and thinks about uh, these problems. And it almost seems like there's a heightened, you know, need or at least a, an, an awareness that needs to be looked at out there for the importance of guarantees. You know, we mentioned earlier, you know, the benefits of annuities and the guarantees behind it for, for lifetime income. And obviously yeah. coupling that with the fact that, you know, defined benefit plans are, are getting fewer and further between. Yes. Um, I think this is, this is a conversation that really needs to happen, you know, sooner than later with a lot of individuals. And Mark, you know, I, I, more I'm thinking about it. Wow. First of all, it's kind of scary when I look at my birth date. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, this is kind of a depressing conversation, but it just says that there, I, I think, Mark, if, if I were having a conversation with you as my client, I think I'd be talking to you about increased risks that you're going to be facing over the next 10 years, right? You may have a job today. If you lose it, what happens? Um, uh, your health. Uh, you think you're healthy today, however, look at what can happen, right? So income security, health security, and um, having emergency funds, right? Really thinking through your entire portfolio from not only from a, you know, guarantee, you know, one end, you know, guaranteed income of social security and other assets, you might have your 401ks, Sebastian, you study so much, but also how do you engineer greater uh, levels of immediate um uh, savings funds, Mark, that you can tap into so you don't have to you know, break up with a piggy bank. I mean, is that, what do you think? How, some how, people don't have it though, Paul. Some people just don't have that. You know, well, we they, they, they don't. They emergency don't, but, fund, you have to fund it. You have to fund retirement. You have to, you know, right. save for your child's, your, your kid's college. I mean, it, if it's, it, it, there's just a lot of places that you need to put money. And oh, I, I think I, that, I, the whole I, notion of, 
a retirement plan as being a, a, an emergency fund. I mean, I, I agree with Steve Esch, that's not that wasn't the intention, but it seems like it's a necessity for potentially not, you know, because there isn't an emergency room for fund. Or well, you know, fund. the counseling may be a little more proactive saying, you know, you know, you know what, well, you've actually got it. You should, sh to do the right thing, change your lifestyle today. You've got to make some, you should make some dramatic changes in order to um, protect yourself fully out over the next 10 years. Hard well, truth. Well, that's the yeah. big thing is it, it, it often seems like financial advice is around sort of earning your, earning your way out of your lifestyle, like through, through investment returns. And that's hard. And also you, you have to pay tax sooner or later on those returns. There are much higher implicit returns on just spending less. And so, you know, taking sort of the, you know, the union of what you're saying, Paul, and what you're saying, Siavash, is that like, like, there really has to be this assessment of like, well, what is it? What does it really mean to be me now and going forward? And that's, that's, that is, that's less about the asset side. It's more about sort of creating a liability, like booking a liability in your personal balance sheet that's equal to the present value of all your future expenses. And that's, and that's not what is done enough, in my opinion. Yeah, it's easier to tap into your 401k than, <laughs> than, than deal with the tough medicines sometimes you have to take. And I mean, I, I get it. I think we're all, you know, we're well aware. Everyone is, is struggling in a variety of different ways in this, you know, bad situation we're all in. But um, but in particular, you know, you said something earlier, Sivesh, that, you know, that resonated with me. You know, Social Security was really designed to, um, and, and te initially to design to keep, you, keep people out of poverty at advanced ages. It's not going to do it alone. So, you know, I I I think that we we're confronting with a very challenging situation now. But ten years or fifteen years down the road, I think it could be, you know, that it, it it could repeat itself for those folks that are, you know, moving into post retirement age at that point. Uh, I mean, right now we are using a very generous definition of poverty, uh, generous in the sense that the poverty the federal poverty line level is quite low. It's just enough for people to not to starve. It doesn't even uh, think about housing or anything like that. So when we say people are under poverty line, it means that they can't even eat. That's not what you understand from poverty. If you can't pay rent, you're also poor. So if you look at what real levels of poverty in the country are, you will see that many people who are receiving social security are facing poverty. Technically, we call it near poverty, like if you're like making 200%, like twice the uh, federal poverty level, which is very low. Uh, you are still, I, I think, and many uh, researchers think that people who are at that level are still near poor or experiencing uh, actual poverty. So given that, Social Security is already not enough for many people. We don't have to wait for... Uh, possible uh, further cuts in benefits uh, in case uh, they fail to like increase the uh, revenue for social security. Uh, and it brings me to back to policy uh, from that, that we have, people are facing so many different risks. And in some other countries, like there is this comparison with European countries uh, in every election recently, uh, especially presidential elections and people saying that like, look at Europe and there are like very strong social safety nets. I did an internship uh, in Germany. I'm originally from Iran and uh, I happened to talk to this Iranian guy there who had a restaurant, a small restaurant. And his brother was in the US working the same job in the US. And he was saying that my brother is making four times money I do, pays lower taxes than I do. But I think I'm happier because I'm safe. Nothing can happen to me. He has to worry about everything every day. And that's true because here it's a political choice that uh, people have made to not provide the social safety nets, to have a smaller government. And that's a conversation to, to have and talk about, oh, should we expand the social safety nets? Do we need them or not? But the truth is right now, they don't exist. They're, we have the minimum uh, social safety net for people to use. And until we fix that, we change that, we need to provide uh, 
insurance for ourselves. We have to self-insure. And it's not efficient. It's not easy. Like it's much better if you have uh, insurance such as healthcare that's public. Like you don't save for your own like uh, future uh, sickness. You don't. You cannot save to deal with cancer. It's too expensive. So the only way it works is that you, is to have a, a more uh, gen, uh, public uh, health insurance. And by public, I mean like a, a, an insurance plan that people partic other people participate in to somehow divide the risk. But uh, we don't do that with other things. Uh, we take some other things uh, on our own and we self-insure. And until, until we have a social safety net that's working, we have to make sure that we are doing the set of insurance right. And that's very hard. And that's where you can help a lot. You can help people a lot as uh, advisors to provide them the tools that they need to self-insure against like living longer, against not being able to work and many other things. Yeah, well, listen. Thank you so much. We're we're at the at the end, end of our time, uh, Sivesh. This was fascinating. We'll uh, we'll certainly put your uh, the link to your uh, policy agenda for the Biden administration in here. I think you've got some very interesting proposals uh, at the policy level. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what, Let's what see. happens. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but not too hopeful. <laughs> so I guess uh, with that, any any final thoughts? Uh, uh, just to bring it back, I mean, we're on the annuity show, and a lot of what you <laughs> talked about, um, you know, is applicable when we talk about insuring yourself and some of the benefits and features that annuities can bring to bear. So, uh, thank you. Really appreciate your perspective. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for putting up the link. Sure. Hey. So, um, a, a few things. One, this, this notion that Obviously, we need to create an environment where older workers can work and get jobs. And those jobs can only come from companies. I mean, the government can only hire so many people. Yeah. And it, it's you know, this, this notion that you have to actually reduce the risk of, of employing folks that are older um, is, is valuable because the risk, the, risk of, of, the risk of the worker working and still bearing some of their own personal risk and it not being given to the employer um, is lower, I think, than not being able to work at all. <laughs> so um, I think that's a very important point. And the other, the other element you brought up that was very interesting to me, because I'm very focused on social security these days, is this, is this idea that like, even though it's non-optimal to take social security early, um, for some people, it's gonna be an absolute necessity. So, so putting parameters around when one has to make that tough decision, I think is a very, uh, I think it's a very important exercise. So thank you. Yeah. Listen, thanks so much. And uh, Sivesh, pleasure. All my co-hosts, thank you. And tune in again next week for another episode of That Annuity Show. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com. Thank you.